Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, my name is Ramesh. Uh, I'm Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at California State University at Northridge here in the United States of America, where it's 9 p.m. California time. And I'm delighted to be speaking to you today on the topic of optical engineering and fiber optic communications. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Indo-US Council for Engineering Education and Professor Krishna Vedula and our uh, assistant today, Mr. Sridhar, for their support in making this broadcast possible. Uh, my contact information is on the slide. My email address is s.ramesh at ieee.org. So if you run out of time today to answer any questions, please feel free to contact me at that address, and I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. A little bit of background about my uh, technical abilities. Uh, I'm currently serving as a dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at uh, California State University at Northridge. Uh, prior to that, I taught at a sister campus, which is in Sacramento, for almost 20 years. Uh, my interests are in the areas of communications engineering, uh, optical engineering, as well as analog integrated circuits. And my research interests span uh, primarily fiber optic communications. I did my graduate work, uh, my master's and doctorate from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And prior to that, I received my bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering from the University of Madras in India, uh, and more specifically, uh, Regional Engineering College, uh, Thiruchirappalli in Southern India. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, I teach now in California, and I'm part of a system which is the largest uh, public university uh, in the United States. The California State University system has 23 campuses with over 400,000 students, almost 50,000 of them in graduate programs. We offer the master's degree in a variety of fields. Uh, as far as degree production, the 23 campuses produced almost 95,000 degrees in the year 2009 and 2010. Uh, Cal State Northridge, which is the campus at which I teach, is the second largest campus with an enrollment of over 35,000 students. Uh, specifically in terms of engineering and computer science, uh, the California State University system produces over half the number of engineers and computer scientists in the state of California every year, which is over 5,000 engineers and computer scientists. One other uh, data point that I'm very proud to share with you, uh, our school, and in particular our engineering program, was ranked number one in the nation for having the fastest growing program three years ago, based on the number of degrees that we granted between 2005 and 2008 by the American Society of Engineering Education. So with that bit of background, uh, let me jump into the topic for today. Uh, today I hope to speak to you about optical fiber communications, first by giving you a brief overview of different types of optical fibers and their properties. Then we'll talk about uh, sources, optical sources and photodetectors that are used in uh, communication systems. And finally, I hope to close with uh, some examples of optical communication systems. During the course of the presentation, uh, I will be using uh, some simulation tools, uh, some pedagogies that I've used when I was teaching this course. I taught a graduate course in this area for a number of years. And then I also want to give you a couple of examples, including an emerging area that is very interesting, as well as an example of uh, industry collaboration here at the university that I'm working at. Uh, the last one, the example, is really a solar photovoltaic project, but the idea is how academics can work with industry in order to promote uh, better learning and better opportunities for our students. So without much ado, let's take a look at the fundamentals of a communication system. So any fundamental communication system consists of a transmitter, a channel, and a receiver. And the purpose of the system is to send information from point A to point B. The earliest communication systems were mostly optical and acoustical, and they were limited by distance. They were limited by power. Now, with the advent of the electronic age, and in particular, the uh, electronic telegraph, things started moving rather rapidly. Uh, now, we had the ability to superimpose information onto a carrier, a high-frequency carrier wave. And as you look at the history of this field, uh, they really moved quite rapidly in the mid-1800s all the way through 1900s. Uh, coupled with 
the development of uh, Maxwell's equations describing the propagation of electromagnetic waves, uh, leading to ultimately wireless radio communications. Now the progression of the field is uh, really interesting. Early radio, uh, you, if you look at the frequencies, uh, there were voice signals uh, in the neighborhood of about 15 kilohertz, and the range of frequencies were about a half a megahertz to about two megahertz. From radio, we moved on to television, which uh, was at a higher carrier frequency. And then from television on to microwaves, so from the megahertz domain to the gigahertz domain. And then finally to optical communications, where we're now talking about frequencies that are in the terahertz domain, which is 10 raised to 12 hertz. Now, what has made this possible, uh, in particular uh, for uh, optical communications, is the advent of the optical fiber. So if you think about uh, dielectric uh, waveguides, dielectric slab waveguides, and a cylindrical waveguide in which the optical fiber uh, primarily operates, uh, guided propagation began uh, with the discovery of uh, optical principles and how it could be applied to propagation in the early 1970s. Now, early optical fibers had uh, cores made of silica and they had claddings uh, that were also made of similar materials. However, the manufacturing processes uh, were not sophisticated enough so that the losses in these fibers were incredibly large. So we had losses of the order of almost 1,000 dB per kilometer or 1 dB per meter, which means that uh, it would take a tremendous amount of effort to send information from point A to point B. Remember, in a fundamental communication system, we are concerned about the fidelity of the information that is being transmitted, we're concerned about the data rate, and we're concerned about the information capacity of the link. Over time, the fibers improved, the properties of the fibers improved, and we were able to eliminate the impurities in the optical fibers uh, that caused these huge losses. Now, during the course of my presentation today, we'll look at some of those losses, but I'm going to mention them briefly right now. Absorption is a big component of the loss. Scattering is another component of the loss. And then the third component of the loss is what we call dispersion or spreading. Now, all of these need to be controlled or eliminated in order for us to improve the quality of fiber optic communication systems. Another aspect that we have to keep in mind with the frequencies that we're operating at is that the wavelengths of operation of the fiber optic system. The early systems in the 1970s and 80s operated at what we call the first window, which is between 800 nanometers and 900 nanometers, or the near-infrared region. Over time, within a few years, by the time we got to the 1990s, we had more sophisticated fiber optic systems that now operated in the 1300 nanometer region. And this region in particular uh, is uh, renowned for minimal dispersion. In other words, zero dispersion fibers operate at a wavelength of 1300 nanometers. You'll see why that is the case. The lowest attenuation in optical fibers occurs in the neighborhood of 1500 nanometers. Now, it is really a chicken and egg problem. As the fibers were being developed, one had to also develop simultaneously optical sources and optical detectors that were compatible with the fiber optics in order to make systems possible. So what are some of the advantages of optical fiber communications? Very briefly, the information bandwidth that is afforded by optical fibers is tremendous. Uh, it's approximately 25 terahertz in the two windows that I spoke about, and I'll show you very quickly how that occurs. Fibers are also renowned for low losses. They're renowned for being light. Uh, when security is an issue, when you want to have an immune transmission, uh, immune from electromagnetic interference and crosstalk. Uh, fiber optics is clearly the uh, technology of choice. And last but not the least, with the growth in fiber optic communications, we've also had a growth in a compatible family of devices, lasers, photodetectors, optoelectronic integrated circuits, which have really spawned a number of industries ranging from sensing to biomedical engineering uh, to environmental engineering, where optics, again, is used as, uh, as an enabling tool, or in the case of biomedical engineering, both as a diagnostic tool and as a therapeutic tool. 
So this is a truly integrative field which brings together engineers, computer scientists, material scientists, chemical engineers, physicists, etc., working to solve problems. All right, let's talk a little bit about terahertz communications. If you think about the first laser, the first ruby laser, uh, this operated at a wavelength of 694 nanometers, which is a red wavelength. Now, if you convert that to frequency, that translates to a frequency of 5 times 10 raised to 14 hertz. Now, even if you were to take 1% of this frequency, that's about 5 terahertz, and that can carry, to give you an idea, about a million commercial video channels or a billion telephone calls at the rate of 5 kilohertz per call. So the question is, why isn't this bandwidth being fully utilized? Now, to answer that, we really need to look at how fiber optics has evolved. I talked earlier about the three windows of fiber optics, the first window being uh, the area in the 800 to 900 nanometer range, the second window being the 1300 nanometer range, which is synonymous with low dispersion, and the third window, which is the 1500 nanometer range, which is synonymous with low attenuation. Uh, how do we get these frequencies? If you were to take a wavelength uh, channel, say a wavelength channel which is about 8 tenths of a nanometer in width in the 1500 nanometer window and you take this 8 tenths of a nanometer width channel and convert it to frequency, the frequency bandwidth that you would get, uh, assuming you have 100 gigahertz channels, is approximately 15 terahertz. If you were to do the same thing where the central wavelength is 1300 nanometers, now the wavelength that you get is 14 terahertz. So with sufficient channel spacing between the uh, channels, one is able to then transmit a large number of uh, information channels over the optical bandwidth. So what is required? In order for us to build a communication system, we need switches, we need amplifiers, we need filters, we need connectors, and obviously better modulation schemes. Lots of different uh, techniques and approaches have been proposed. Fiber optics has uh, also spawned the area of what we call wavelength division multiplexing, where multiple wavelengths are transmitted through a single optical fiber, and then at the other end, the wavelengths are demultiplexed and the information is uh, retrieved. Optical amplifiers that entirely operate in the optical domain without conversion from electric to optic, uh, during which process there is losses, optical filters and switches, and finally coherent modulation schemes which have for long been available in conventional communications, but when applied to optics, the advantages are really tremendous. So let's take a look at the major elements of an optical fiber link. So when you look at this diagram right here, uh, we usually have an electrical input signal. Uh, the electrical paths are the ones that are designated by the solid dark line over here, and the optical signal paths are the ones are designated with the cross hash line. So the electrical signal, typically uh, through a drive circuit, is used to modulate an optical source. Once the uh, source is modulated, the signal is then transmitted through, in this case, the channel, which is an optical fiber. Now, depending upon the length through which uh, the signal traverses, depending upon the conditions through which it goes, we typically have a regenerator at some periodic length uh, around, the, around the link. Now, the purpose of the regenerator is threefold. It does reshaping, it does retiming, and clearly it regenerates the signal. But in the process, there is also a conversion. If you look closely at this block diagram right here, you will notice that the optical signal is first met by an optical receiver, which means the signal is now converted from the optical domain to the electrical domain. Then you have some signal processing electronics which work with the signal in the electrical domain. Once again, the electrical signal is used to modulate an optical transmitter and retransmit it through the link. So this process continues depending upon the length of the link that we're talking about. Eventually, when it reaches its destination, there is a suitable optical amplifier, depending upon the level of the signal that is received, uh, and a photo detector to convert the uh, optical signal back to an electrical signal. During the process of transmission, 
there are various losses, attenuation and dispersion that comes into play in the optical fiber that one needs to compensate against as a communication engineer. All right. We've already talked about the operating ranges of uh, components. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you look at the middle of this uh, plot right here, the optical sources that are used have also evolved over time. Now, I'll speak a little bit about this in a few minutes. These are known as direct band gap uh, semiconductors. And these direct band gap semiconductors are usually made of alloys. So, for example, in the 800 to 900 nanometer range, we use a ternary alloy, which is made up of three materials, gallium, aluminum, and arsenide. In the 1300 to 1500 nanometer range, we use quaternary alloys, which are made up of four different types of materials. Uh, one example is indium, gallium, arsenide, phosphide. Now, each of these has some unique properties that allows us to operate at the wavelength of interest. Photodetectors, similarly, operate within specific wavelength domains. So when we're looking at the lower wavelength domain, uh, normally we're restricted to uh, silicon photodetectors, although we might be able to use some in-gas detectors. Uh, when we go to the longer wavelengths, say 1300 to 1500 nanometers, uh, we tend to use uh, in-gas or germanium detectors, and I'll explain why during the course of this presentation. So let's begin first by looking at the fundamental properties of light. What happens to a light wave when it enters a medium? Remember, one of the fundamental properties of the um, uh, material is the fact that uh, the refractive index of the material depends upon the relative permittivity and the relative permeability of the medium. Now, the refractive index, unfortunately, is not a constant at all wavelengths. In particular, in optics, we encounter an effect called the Kerr effect, which is a nonlinear effect causing uh, all kinds of problems when an optical signal enters the, the, the optical fiber. Now, specifically, when you look at wavelength, uh, the wavelength in free space, if you call it lambda zero, once the light wave enters a medium, the wavelength changes to lambda zero over n inside the optical medium. Now, with this background, uh, let's look at what happens to a light wave. So light wave really uh, is a transverse uh, electromagnetic wave, you have an electric field and a magnetic field that are orthogonal to each other, and then the light wave uh, represents propagation in the Z direction. Now, what I'm going to do for you before we go further is to show you a small applet that describes how the electric and magnetic waves uh, combine to produce this light wave. So, uh, we'll go to the applet in just a moment. So, you're looking at uh, a Java applet right here. Uh, that consists of uh, two waves. So you have the green and the blue. And at the moment, the applet is stopped. And I can modify both the amplitude of the X component uh, and simultaneously modify the amplitude of the Y component. I also have the ability to change the phase of the two waves. Uh, now, remember, if the phase is 0 or a multiple of 2 pi, then uh, essentially these two waves are going to be in sync. So let's start the applet so you can see for yourself. So right now, I have uh, a two waves, an X wave and a Y wave. And this is an example, if you will, of linear polarization. Now, let's observe what happens if I were to change the phase of this. Now, you notice the moment I changed the phase from zero to some non-zero number, the um, polarization of the wave also changes. You're seeing what is known as an elliptically polarized wave. Now, under certain conditions, this polarization can be controlled, so you get what is known as circular polarization. Okay? So this is something that is intrinsic to the propagation of light waves. Now, going back to our uh, presentation momentarily, uh, let's keep in mind that light has two different types of properties. When the wavelength of light is very small compared to the dimensions of the object that it encounters, we can typically use what we call ray optics. So, for example, I have a ray optics diagram right here where you have a light ray that is going from one medium into another medium. Uh, in this case, 
Uh, N2 is less than N1, so we say N1 is an optically denser medium compared to N2. And the incident ray makes an angle of phi1. You have a reflected ray and a refracted ray. Now, what is going to happen as you increase this angle of incidence? What is going to happen is that the angle of refraction, in this case, that is phi2, is going to keep increasing until at some point you get what is known as grazing incidence where phi2 becomes exactly 90 degrees. If you were to increase the angle of incidence beyond this critical angle, then the ray is totally internally reflected back into the medium that we are talking about. So this is uh, an analogy that we can use when one is dealing with uh, optical materials that uh, where the wavelength of the light is very, very small compared to the dimensions of the objects. However, in optics, we just talked about lasers, we talked about light sources and fibers where the light actually interacts with materials. Now, in this case, light reflects the dual property, namely the particle property, where it's quantized into specific uh, uh, quanta of energy. So we need to consider both the wave nature of light and the particle nature of light in explaining how fiber optics works. All right. So let's go right to the fiber. So what exactly is a fiber? So when you're looking at this diagram, it consists of a core, it consists of a cladding, and usually it consists of a buffer and various strength materials. The most important thing to remember is that the core has a refractive index that is higher than the surrounding cladding material. Uh, in theory, you could operate without a cladding. You could use air as the boundary material, but for guided wave propagation, it works much better when you have a cladding with a refractive index that is slightly smaller than the core index. So what are some of the key ideas? Uh, the key ideas are N1 is the core index, N2 is the cladding index, and there is a very small difference in values between the core index and the cladding index. We define something known as a numerical aperture, which effectively tells us the light gathering capacity of the fiber, which depends upon N1 and N2. And then finally, the maximum acceptance angle which is very important when we consider the types of sources that can be interfaced with the fiber depends upon the numerical aperture and the refractive index. So this is one of the simplest fibers and it's called a step index fiber and you'll see why in a moment. So if you look at the profiles of these fibers, uh, you see a refractive index of N2 which represents the refractive index in the cladding and you see a refractive index of N1 which represents the refractive index in the core of the optical fiber. And there's a step, a discrete step, where when you go from the core to the cladding, the refractive index drops from N1 to N2. Now, pay particular attention to the dimensions of the fiber. Now, in the fiber on top right here, the core diameter is between 8 and 12 microns, whereas in the fiber in the center, the core diameter is between 50 and 200 microns. Now, the one in the middle uh, is typically referred to as a multi-mode fiber, because it supports numerous modes, whereas the one on top is referred to as a single mode fiber because it supports only the fundamental mode, in this case the HE11 mode. The fiber at the bottom is a very interesting fiber in that the refractive index does not drop abruptly from the core to the cladding, but in fact the refractive index is uh, tapered throughout the core. So this is a radial distribution of refractive index, and this particular fiber is called a graded index optical fiber. All right, so without much ado, uh, I'm not going to go through a derivation of these equations, but we apply Maxwell's equations at the boundary between the core and the cladding, and we end up with a couple of couple differential equations. So the equation on top uh, is in terms of the transverse electric field. The equation on the bottom is in terms of the transverse magnetic field. So these are coupled equations where EC and HC represent the electric and magnetic fields respectively and their variation with the radius, with the phi parameter, and with the direction of propagation. Now, we're more interested in the solutions of these equations and how it is they describe propagation of light within the optical fiber. So, in order to find it, we have to solve these wave equations subject to boundary conditions. We use a technique known as separation of variables, and the nature of the solution, uh, clearly given propagation, is harmonic inside the core of the optical fiber, because that's where the propagation takes place, whereas in the cladding of the fiber, it's exponentially decaying. I want to define a couple of parameters for you. One that is known as the V number of the fiber, which is, 
can also be considered to be a cutoff frequency. Now the V number depends upon the fiber parameters through the numerical aperture, the radius of the fiber. K is referred to as a wave propagation constant, which is 2 pi over lambda, lambda being the operating wavelength. Now this particular number is interesting. When V is less than 2.405, the fiber supports a single mode. And I'll explain to you very quickly why that happens. There is also a normalized propagation constant. Now propagation, as we described, takes place in the core of the optical fiber. So when you look at this cutoff condition, beta is a propagation constant along the direction of propagation. And you see two limits there. At the lower limit, when beta equals k1, we are looking at what is known as the axial ray, which is traveling along the axis of the optical fiber. When beta equals k2, the mode is basically cut off. In other words, there is no transmission because you've reached that maximum acceptance angle in the fiber. So that's a simple physical picture that goes with this equation. If we were to solve this equation, uh, this particular solution has been done using a program known as MATLAB, uh, we would be looking at uh, Bessel functions of the first kind, uh, which is the, the blue uh, curves that you see there, and then we look at modified Bessel functions of the second kind, which is the propagation uh, and the cladding, the intersection of these two curves gives the various modes that can propagate within the optical fiber. So in this particular case, uh, we can very quickly identify where the cutoff is based on the V number, and we can also identify what the modes are that travel. Once we know the modes that travel in the fiber, we can pretty much determine everything we need to know about the particular propagation, including the propagation constant, the parameters, the propagation, etc. And this would be very, very important from an optical communication perspective. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about graded index fibers. Now I mentioned that uh, step index fibers uh, have a refractive index in the core that is constant, a refractive index in the cladding that is constant, and there is an abrupt drop from the core to the cladding. Now in a graded index fiber, the refractive index in the core is not constant, but in fact varies as a function of radius. So this is an equation that describes how it varies. And in particular, the parameter alpha describes the profile of that variation. So for instance, when alpha is 2, we have what is known as a parabolic index uh, optical fiber. Now why do we do this? Uh, there's two reasons why we do this. One of the reasons is that we want to try and eliminate what we know as dispersion. Now, when you look at the optical fiber itself, I talked to you about loss in the optical fiber. There are two types of losses. Uh, one is known as intramodal dispersion, which can be broken down by chromatic dispersion and waveguide dispersion. Chromatic dispersion is where the propagation constant in this case uh, varies because your refractive index is changing as a function of wavelength. Waveguide dispersion Remember what we said about the wavelength of light being very small compared to the objects that it encounters. In the case of a single mode fiber, uh, you're dealing with dimensions that are extremely small because the core radius is probably about 3 microns. And so there is a dispersion effect, a spreading effect that comes as a result of that. Then when you're dealing with a purely multi-mode fiber, which allows you to transmit multiple modes, each mode is traveling uh, with a different velocity uh, through this fiber at a single frequency. As a result, if you were to look at a point in time, then these modes are all arriving at different instances, causing what we know as dispersion. In addition to this type of dispersion, the fiber also introduces attenuation, because the material absorbs the light, some of the light, instead of transmitting it. It also scatters the light based upon inhomogeneities and impurities in the fiber. All of this together leads to what we call as a loss curve of the fiber, the, the initial curve that I showed you. Now here is a graphical example of what would happen uh, in the case of dispersion. So we have two input pulses, and these two pulses are separate at time t1, and after some time has passed through the fiber, you can still distinguish the pulses between uh, the two pulses that were transmitted. However, with a lot of dispersion uh, after some length of time, the pulses begin to overlap and they're barely distinguishable. 
Now, if these two pulses represented information that you were transmitting through the fiber, the detector at the other end would have a challenge in determining which pulse is transmitted and make a decision about the information that was being sent. So this is the effect of pulse broadening and attenuation in optical fiber communications. Let's switch our attention to optical sources. Uh, again, I realize that uh, in a webinar of this type, it's very hard to go into too much detail in any particular area, but this was just to give you a flavor of what the issues are and how we go about solving those problems. So there are two types of optical sources that are primarily used. Uh, incoherent sources that are light emitting diodes and coherent sources that are uh, semiconductor lasers. Now, uh, let's look at the principles of operations. Uh, there are two uh, important ideas here that I want to convey to you. And the ideas are optical and carrier confinement. Now, in order for us to produce light and make sure that the light gets coupled into the optical fiber, we need to pick materials uh, that are suitable uh, for that kind of transmission. In particular, we need to pick what are known as direct band gap materials. Uh, once we pick the materials, the materials need to be constructed in such a way, in the case of the LED, that you achieve a high degree of optical confinement, a high degree of carrier confinement. So let's take a look at uh, a diagram that shows us how this happens. This particular diagram is what's known as a double heterostructure configuration. So here we have a recombination region, which is uh, the region where most of the action takes place, and you can see that it's a very, very thin region. It's about three-tenths of a micron in width. Then surrounding this region, uh, we have what are known as light guiding and carrier confinement regions. So in other words, on either side of the recombination region is where the uh, optical confinement and the carrier confinement takes place. So very quickly, how does the optical confinement take place? Take a look at the bottom of this graph. You have the active region here, which is region 3, which has a refractive index that is larger than the surrounding regions. Same principle as the optical fiber. The core has a high index, the cladding has a lower index. The active region has a higher index, region 2 and 4 have lower indices, which means that the light that you produce can be effectively confined to the active region. Obviously, I'm simplifying this a lot, but we have to get into radiative and non-radiative recombinations. You try to make sure that the recombinations result in radiation, in this case, electromagnetic radiation, which is light. The carrier confinement is an equally important aspect because when you have holes and electrons that recombine, uh, that is what produces this, uh, this effect, and we make it so. So we have materials with dissimilar band gap energies. There's an electron barrier on one side, and there's a hole barrier on the other side, such that the holes and electrons have to recombine where there are injected minority carriers leading to high radiative recombination times. I want to now quickly uh, switch our attention to another applet that shows you how this might be used in the classroom. So let's go to the other applet. And this particular applet uh, showcases a light emitting diode. So it's pretty much the same principle that I talked about earlier. You have the active region, the recombination region. Uh, you have a p-type region. You have a window. You have an n-type region and a substrate. Now, uh, pay close attention to the top of this graph right here where you're looking at the direct energy ga gap and the wavelength. Now, this is a material property right here. So if I were to choose, let's say, gallium aluminum arsenide, which is a material right here, uh, at the moment it says that the light that is produced is not in the visible range. Why is it so? Because the band gap is about 1.43 electron volts, and the light that is produced is about 0 0.8 micron. Let's assume that I want to produce visible light from this. So if I were to change the mole fraction of the material, I can see what might happen. So you just see what I did. I changed the mole fraction of the material, in this case the fraction of aluminum to uh, gallium in this particular uh, material. I'm using 12%, and when I did that, the color of the light that is emitted changed. Why did it change? Because the band gap energy is a function of that chemical property. Now I can change this chemical property and pr produce different types of uh, colors, if you will. Uh, or I can go to a different material, 
and see what happens there in terms of uh, in terms of the light. So this is a very very useful tool when we are teaching uh, students in optical engineering what the effect is of different materials on the wavelength of light that is produced. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Now the light emitting diode, unfortunately, produces a spectral pattern that is rather diffuse. So there are two configurations here. You know, one is a um, uh, LED, uh, which is called an edge emitting LED, which is fairly narrow. The other one is a surface emitting LED, which is very, very broad. Okay. I see that I need to speed up because uh, we're not very we need to be uh, at this point in the presentation. Let's talk a little bit about lasers. Uh, semiconductor lasers uh, produce coherent light, and these are required uh, for communication systems, especially high-speed, high data rate uh, communication systems. Uh, three fundamental processes here, absorption, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission, and the uh, lasers themselves have what is known as an optical resonant cavity. So you still have optical confinement, you still have uh, electrical confinement, but in addition to that, we create resonance where we allow this optical beam to bounce between two mirrors and then eventually produce a light beam once the stimulated emission com conditions are met. I want to show you one quick applet here uh, that deals with that. And here we go. So in this particular applet, uh, I have two mirrors, a mirror on one side which is perfectly reflecting, a mirror on the other side which is 80% reflecting. So we're going to start the applet and you can see what it does. So uh, once the pulse hits the mirror on the other side, now you notice that 20% uh, of that got transmitted. Why? Because 80% was reflecting. Now, the next time around, uh, the same thing were to happen again, you would see that the fraction now changes to 16%. So this continues until uh, we have uh, extinction, if you will. So the photon lifetime in the cavity uh, needs to be sustained over time, and this is where the process of pumping comes in, the process of stimulated emission comes in. Again, this is a wonderful tool to demonstrate how a laser operates and how a laser can be used in a fiber optic communication system. All right, let's go right back to our PowerPoint. Uh, in this case, we're dealing with what's known as a distributed feedback laser. Okay. Uh, this is a characteristic of a laser. Uh, it's, it's very, very typical. It's called a PI curve. Usually we want to operate in the linear region of the curve right here, and we want to be operating above threshold. A typical laser, like the one that I demonstrated to you, is a multi-mode laser, uh, produces multiple modes, various spectra right here. This particular laser looks like it is operating at the wavelength of about 840 nanometers, and it has a Gaussian output profile. Uh, it can also be described with the Lorentzian function, and then you can very nicely model the individual modes and their properties as they connect to the optical fiber. All right. So the big issue here is how do we couple this optical source to the optical fiber? The bad news is it's a lossy process. Uh, we've got to be really careful because we've done a good job producing the light with optical confinement and carry confinement, but now we have to worry about the varying refractive indices between the source material, which if it's gallium arsenide, it's probably a neighborhood of about 3.6, and the core of the fiber, which is about 1.5. So we use a number of matching techniques. Uh, we use lenses. We use couplers, all kinds of techniques in order to ensure that the light that is produced in the uh, source, be it an LED, be it a laser, as much of it gets coupled into the optical fiber. This is a very, very critical point because if we lose uh, light in this uh, process here due to misalignment, say lateral misalignment or axial misalignment or longitudinal misalignment, every one of those losses is going to end up as a penalty at the very end when we try to detect the signal. So these are the losses. The two fibers are laterally misaligned, longitudinally separated, or angularly misaligned. Uh, that was a quick overview of sources. Now I'm going to jump to the detector end of things and fundamentally look at a photodiode. So here's a photodiode, which is a PIN device, and light with a certain uh, wavelength 
impinges on this uh, photodiode. So what happens? When the light falls on this uh, device, provided the energy of the light beam, which is represented by h nu, nu is c over lambda, the frequency of the, the light beam, provided the light beam has the energy that is greater than the band gap energy of this detector, then it generates a photoelectron pair. So the electron goes in one direction, the hole goes in the other direction, and you have a current in the output circuit. So this then leads to the question of the responsivity of the photodiode. Now when you look at these uh, uh, curves right here, there are three different types of materials. There is silicon uh, here, there is indium gallium arsenide here, and there's germanium. And I've marked various quantum efficiencies uh, out here. So what exactly is the quantum efficiency? The quantum efficiency is a measure of the number of photoelectrons that are produced in response to the incident photons on the device. Now if you want to make the quantum efficiency really large, you'd have a very large absorption layer, very large depletion layer in the case of the photodiode, and have the best possible quantum efficiency. But if you stop and think for a moment, if you were to make the quantum efficiency really large, then it's going to take a long time due to drift and diffusion in the material for you to be able to collect that signal and produce a current in the output circuit. So there's a trade-off between high efficiency and high speed, bandwidth distance product. So in this case, we're looking at the responsivity, which has units of amps per watt, uh, IP over W, if you will, uh, and, and the responsivity varies. Uh, now, the responsivity at a given wavelength uh, for a given intensity would be the same, but it's going to vary depending on the type of material. We also notice at some point in time, uh, as the wavelength increases, the amount of energy that is uh, coming from the light beam is going to be insufficient to produce a photoelectron pair. Therefore, the detector is no longer effective once you cross the cutoff wavelength for that particular detector. So silicon, for instance, is practically blind once you go to the 1.1 micron wavelength. Likewise, uh, germanium, you know, past the 1.7 micron wavelength and so forth. All right. What are some of the things that affect the performance of detectors? number of different effects. Uh, there's quantum effects that are fundamental limitations, uh, also known as short noise. Uh, this is due to the random arrival of uh, photons at the detector. There is dark current, which is caused by a signal in the absence of any light falling in the detector. There is leakage current, which is due to defects, both at the surface and at the bulk level. And finally, there are thermal effects. So all of these provide limitations to the system. Okay. Uh, so key components in the optical receiver, uh, the photodetector, the amplifier, and the subsequent signal processing. Okay. So now let's look at the link again. We've talked about the source. We've talked about the fiber. We've talked about the impact of the source uh, and what happens to the pulses as they go through the fiber. Now they're at the detector. They've been detected. And we have an electric current because the photodiode received an optical signal, converted it to an electrical signal through the process that I just described. Now the job of the amplifier is to determine, ultimately in the case of a digital communication system, whether a one or a zero was transmitted in a particular time slot. Now it is subject to all of these noises that we've talked before. So the system really needs to operate in such a way that we're able to overcome these noises. Now, without going into too much detail, the probability of error, uh, in this particular case, we're using a case of Gaussian type of noise. Uh, the probability of error can be described in terms of the signal to noise ratio, which is the V over sigma number that you see here. And V over sigma represents the peak signal to the RMS noise ratio. I want to spend just a second talking about this graph here. So the graph here demonstrates what is known as the bit error rate, which is the number of bits that are received erroneously over the total number of bits that are transmitted as a function of the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, if this were a communication system, let's say a telephone communication system that is operating at a rate of, say, 1.544 megabits per second, and we had a signal-to-noise ratio maybe of about 8.5, well, that would correspond to a bit error rate of roughly 10 raised to minus 5. Let's put this in context. A 10 raised to minus 5 bit error rate uh, for a communication system operating at a data rate of 1.544 megabit per second means that 
on the average, we should expect an error every 65 milliseconds. That is pretty large and unacceptable. So how do we change that? If we were to change the signal-to-noise ratio by 3 dB, in other words, we go from uh, a linear value of 8.5, that's about 18.6 dB, to uh, a value of V over sigma of 12, then the bit error rate now drops to about 10 raised to minus 9, which in this case means an error every 650 seconds. So you can clearly see uh, there is a very, very small window in which the signal-to-noise ratio uh, positively impacts the bit error rate or the performance of the communication system. All right. I'm going to skip over a few slides here uh, so we can jump to receivers. Uh, receivers, again, sensitivity is an important characteristic. The dynamic range of the receiver is important. Uh, it needs to be uh, fairly fast. It needs to be able to acquire the signal rapidly. Okay. Let's jump to uh, link budgets here. So one of the things we do in an optical communication system is uh, a simple link budget. So we want to make sure that the system that we design is operating with the power levels that we have available. So what we end up doing is we create a loss power budget for every component in the system, the optical source, the coupling loss, the splices, the attenuation, uh, the detection, uh, the noises that take place in the detector, etc. When this is translated to a graph, we get something like this. So in this graph, we have the receiver sensitivity, which is at this point. Uh, we have the connector loss. There is usually a margin that we build in for the system in order to make sure that uh, the system is uh, capable of withstanding tolerances uh, in the uh, design of the uh, components. Uh, then there is a loss that is allocated to the cable and splices. Uh, we have the actual power that is coupled from the source. So ultimately, what we have available is between these two dotted lines that you see right here, uh, the cable coupled power. Now, if we were looking at this in terms of a known fiber, in this particular case, the fiber has an attenuation of 3.5 dB per kilometer, you find that the maximum distance that you can transmit using this fiber is about 6 kilometers. So this is an analysis that we would do just to make sure that we have sufficient power to transmit. But this is only part of the equation. Remember, bandwidth and data rate are just as important uh, in the case of a communication system. So we also do what is known as a transmission distance versus data rate curve, except in this case we superimpose on the power budget that I just talked about both the limits due to attenuation as well as the limits due to dispersion. Now depending upon the length of the link, depending upon the distance that the uh, signal has to travel, we will find that uh, certain choices of components uh, give us the best possible transmission through the optical fiber. So if it's a long distance communication link, more than likely modal dispersion is going to be the limit. If it's a short haul link, uh, we're probably going to be looking at material dispersion, trying to overcome that, etc. Okay. So I want to give you a flavor for a link right there. So let me go back to one other topic here. And we'll wrap this up fairly quickly. Uh, and this topic is uh, coherent optical communications. So one of the ways we can improve the communication system, uh, both the receiver sensitivity as well as the utilization of the bandwidth, is by using techniques that are coherent in nature. Uh, typically, we get about 20 dB improvement in receiver sensitivity. So if you think about the power budget that I just showed you, somebody just gave you a bonus of 20 dB by using the coherent scheme. So that's 20 dB extra power that you have to play with uh, that you can allocate to various components uh, in your losses. The sensitivity of the system is also much better. It's about 100 times greater than a comparable IMDD stands for Intensity Modulation Direct Detection. Okay. Now, coherent systems in the optical domain are any systems where the two optical waves mix nonlinearly. In the electrical domain, uh, we usually refer to coherent systems in terms of detection where detection techniques with the receiver tracks the face of the incoming signals. Fundamentally, we can either deal with the amplitude, we can deal with the frequency, or the face of the signal. So in the case of on-off keying, uh, 
uh, the phase is a constant, and the amplitude can take one of two values during each bit period. In the case of frequency shift keying, the amplitude is held a constant, but the instantaneous frequency can be one of two values if it's a binary frequency shift, or if it could be a, a multi-frequency shift keying, you could have multiple frequencies defined as well, like quarter degree and so on. In the case of phase shift keying, which is the most sophisticated scheme, uh, omega m is a modulation frequency and beta is a modulation in index. In this case, the phase varies uh, with the, the signal that we're trying to send. Now, I don't have time to go through a derivation of the advantages of each of these systems, but the three systems that I'm showing you here, intensity modulation, direct detection, uh, the heterodyne system, and finally the homodyne system, uh, the heterodyne and homodyne system both use what's known as a local oscillator. The homodyne system gives you the best sensitivity. In other words, when you compare the intensity modulation system and the homodyne system, you get a 6 dB performance advantage between the intensity modulation system and the homodyne system. Between the heterodyne system and intensity modulation, you get a 3 dB performance advantage. Again, when we think about the performance of communication systems, coherent systems allow you to uh, take advantage of this power sensitivity as well as receiver selectivity, therefore you're able to send multiple channels through. Okay. I want to go back and uh, cover one, two other topics here. And let's see, I want to just briefly tell you about um, wavelength division uh, multiplexing here. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind for coherent systems is that the sources that we use need to have fairly narrow line widths. You know, otherwise it's, uh, it defeats the purpose because the coherent systems, particularly uh, phase shift keyed systems, need very, very narrow line widths. Uh, the uh, type of lasers that are used, uh, you can see that very quickly how challenging this can be. The line width uh, for a phase shift keyed heterodyne and homodyne system is in the kilohertz range whereas a typical laser will be hundreds of megahertz range, which you can use for on-off keying. So these are some of the technical challenges that we need to overcome. But if you overcome these challenges, then the receiver sensitivity and selectivity are there for us as advantages to take. Uh, we will not cover optical amplifiers, other than just to say that the optical amplifier eliminates the need for the regeneration by keeping the signal entirely in the optical domain. All right. Optical CDMA is finally an, uh, an alternative to wavelength division uh, uh, multiplexing. You could use that in lieu of uh, uh, wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, basically, each of the uh, uh, signals is assigned a unique code, and then we use what's known as correlation detection uh, in order to uh, uh, recover the signal. Wavelength division multiplexing, though, in the optical uh, regime, is, is really a, a, a very widely used concept, both uh, coarse wavelength division multiplexing, CWDM, as well as DWDM, uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing, are very, very widely used for optical communication systems. Okay. We will not do optical uh, instruments. Uh, I want to talk just for a minute about an emerging area of interest. Uh, single mode fibers have the highest bandwidth in optical fibers, but yet uh, given the local, uh, given the interest currently with local and storage area networks and computer interconnects, uh, there is renewed interest in the area of high-speed transmission in multi-mode optical fibers. And these are particularly good for 10 gigabit per second systems. Uh, since we're out of time and I want to save some time for questions, I'll give you a reference to uh, a paper. This is from the Journal of uh, Lightwave Technology right here high-speed transmission and multi-mode fibers that talks about how 10 gigabit per second systems can be implemented even with 850 nanometer components. In particular, with an OM3 system, you can get up to 300 meters of transmission uh, at 10 gigabit per second. So there are some good IEEE standards that define this. Now, if you were to do this with uh, electrical components, instead of 300 meters, you would be looking at a link length of about 7 meters, pretty dramatic reduction. Uh, but just by doing it optically, uh, we are able to increase the length. And we can also do much better uh, depending upon the type of fiber. This is an OM3 type of fiber. Uh, 
that has a 50 micron core and a bandwidth of about uh, 1500 megahertz kilometer. But if you were to go to an OM4, that could very easily increase to about 3500 uh, megahertz kilometer. I promised you I'd tell you about one industry project uh, that we were working on, and this has got absolutely nothing to do with uh, fiber optics, but it has everything to do with photovoltaics. Uh, this is what we call a design clinic model in our university. And in this case, our students were working uh, on a project for our parking lot. So this is both to produce power, uh, which is connected to the grid, as well as provide shade. Uh, it gets pretty warm in California where we are. And in, uh, the, 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 the photovoltaic panels, the first generation panels that you see in this diagram, are first uh, generation panels, so they're fixed and they're not very efficient. Uh, uh, they, they're solid, uh, but they just don't produce uh, as much as we can. With these panels that you see in this diagram here, uh, these are what are known as um, concentrated photovoltaics made by a company called Spectralab, a uh, collaborator of Boeing. And our university, in uh, conjunction with Boeing, has set up a plant that actually produces 100 kilowatts of power. So this is a field. Uh, there's about 32 arrays here. Uh, these are triple junction photovoltaic cells, uh, and they track the sun. So the difference between the panels that you see here and the panels that I showed you on the previous uh, screen are that these panels track the sun and actually produce power. Uh, a couple of my colleagues here, Professor Bruno Sorno, and Stuart Prince, who teach in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And then their students designed a dual access tracker system, a mechanism supported by Boeing Corporation, so that the system could actually produce power. So uh, in uh, conclusion, I would like to say that uh, optical fiber communications and optics in general is a very enabling field. It's an opportunity for us in universities to work with students, to work with faculty, to promote research, to promote uh, careers in a wide variety of fields. I've touched upon the fundamentals of the field. I've given you an idea about some of the potential opportunities during my presentation. And I would like to uh, give you more information. You can look at it on our website. And at this point, I would like to thank you for participating in this webinar and go to uh, questions. So uh, open for questions at this point in time. Thank you again. There are two questions. If you like, I, I can read them out. Please. What are the techniques used to convert electrical signal to light signal and vice versa? So we use a number of modulation uh, uh, techniques. One is a direct modulation of the uh, uh, of the light light beam using the uh, so if you recall the PI curve of the laser. Uh, we uh, want to modulate the uh, signal uh, uh, electrically uh, and uh, the uh, in the linear portion of the curve because it has to be above threshold. Uh, that would be one technique. Uh, and there are, mo there are other techniques that we can use depending again on the type of uh, sources, optical sources that you would be using. Current modulation would be one. You could vary the current uh, through the device. Uh, ultimately, you want to be able to uh, control the optical output with the signal that you seek to transmit through the fiber. Next question, please. There is a comment from Dr. J. Paul Tureja. Last mile coverage by optical fibers in crowded streets may have been highlighted as a unique advantage of OFC. I agree, yeah. Attendees can type in their questions at the questions chat box. So we're still online and happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Professor Navarun says, very informative session. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Um, Professor Kulkar, he says, um, computation with few gigahertz is available, but communication with few gigahertz is not available. Any reason? That's an interesting question. Again, uh, when, we, when we're looking at uh, uh, fiber optic uh, uh, devices, uh, the, the, the electronic uh, devices, uh, you know, clearly are limited uh, based upon uh, Moore's law and scaling and so forth. Uh, but with optical devices, uh, I think we can use the inherent parallelism that is there in optics to, to, uh, to both improve our capacity to compute. In other words, if you don't have to convert it back to the electrical domain, I think we're doing well. So using optical amplifiers, using optical switches, opti optical multiplexers, etc., uh, we can we can continue to preserve the quality. If I understood your question correctly. Professor Raki Muta says, "Thank you. Nice information in this session." Thank you, sir. Which are the centers in India where good work is going on? That is a uh, good question. I'm uh, familiar with the uh, center in Cochin. Uh, Cochin University uh, Science and Technology, I believe, has uh, optics. So obviously, the Raman Institute is very well known all over the world. Uh, my understanding of the optical industry in India is that uh, uh, it is uh, still in its infancy and it's growing. Uh, and when you look at the evolution of the industry in the United States, you'll see that uh, uh, we've shifted from communications to sensing to, at the moment, uh, to biomedical engineering, where optics is used both for diagnostics and therapeutics. What about IIT Delhi, Ghatak, Thyagarajan? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, I wouldn't be doing justice uh, in the in the you know course of this webinar uh, to list uh, all of the wonderful colleagues uh, in universities in India. And, and clearly, yes, uh, they're very very well known in the field. I've published extensively, and uh, I've done wonderful work both uh, professors uh, Ghatak and Thyagarajan as well as his students. Uh, so my response is more to uh, some of the industries that are trying to uh, work with students in this area. Uh, as far as I know, it's still a very, very limited pool of students who go to work in this area. Uh, and that hopefully will change as people see the opportunities, not just in communications. I know, I know this talk was focused on communications, but clearly there's other areas uh, where optics can play a huge part. And the techniques that you have with optical sources, fibers, detectors, etc., can be applied in a variety of environments uh, besides electrical engineering. Is there any new technology after OFC? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, Professor Raki, if you can um, clarify it, I will go to the next question and wait for a response. Will optical computation to the extent of a few hundred gigahertz be available? Uh, this is not an area that I'm terribly familiar with, uh, but I know that uh, people have been working on this for a while uh, and they've Again, the the approach uh, that I saw probably you know ten years ago, five years ago, was uh, trying to approach uh, the, the area of computation as they do in the electrical domain. And uh, some of the newer devices, some of the newer materials, uh, lend themselves to other techniques, which probably can extend that uh, to a few hundred gigahertz. But these are all very laboratory oriented at this point in time and uh, probably a survey of the literature would uh, reveal that information. 
is OFC only fastest way to communication? So I, I'll t uh, let me make an assumption because it's an acronym and I assume it's the optical fiber communication is what they're talking about, right? Uh, you could, uh, you know, clearly you could uh, look at single mode optical fibers and uh, would give you high bandwidth, could operate at uh, different wavelengths, the three wavelengths that we talked about today uh, were limited to 800, 1300, and 1500. If you were to go to longer wavelengths, say in the three micron uh, region, you could potentially get even lower attenuation and uh, you know, higher throughput. The question is, do we have sources and detectors that are compatible at these wavelengths? So yes, uh, there's always room for improvement. Uh, one of the areas that I want to mention as far as bandwidth optimization, there's the interplay between the dispersion and attenuation. You have low dispersion at 1300 nanometers and low attenuation at 1500 nanometers. And you could potentially create uh, zero dispersion fibers or you could have dispersion shifted fibers depending on the wavelength at which you want to operate. So yes, it is possible to create uh, larger bandwidth, uh, if you will, depending on uh, your interest and depending on uh, the refractive index profile in the core of the fiber. Uh, the, um, professor who asked previous question, is there any new technology after OFC says, I mean that, is there any new technology introduced for communications? after optical fibers? After optical fiber communications, well, uh, you know, if you, uh, I think history is uh, providing us with a good answer here because early communication systems were line of sight optics and line of sight acoustics where you had horns and uh, light beams and lighthouses and whatnot. And then over time we went from free space optical communication to guided wave propagation. Uh, and the medium and some of the earliest fibers, we had liquid core optical fibers at the very, very early stage of development of optical fibers. So uh, there will be I think there will continue to be advances in materials, both uh, when it comes to sources as well as the channels through which we can transmit uh, information and uh, bio uh, molecular uh, devices, uh, uh, signaling, etc. Uh, but most of these are, you know, very much in their infancy. Uh, one of the projects we have uh, uh, in our university right now is a brain control interface project where uh, the uh, user's uh, brain waves are interpreted by a headset that uh, he or she wears. It controls a neural network which then ultimately drives a transducer. Uh, and in this case, a wheelchair. So it's a wheelchair-bound user. So uh, to answer the question, are there other communication schemes? I'm sure there will be advances in materials uh, that will eventually lead us to better bandwidth uh, utilization, uh, better sources, uh, better media, better detection, whatnot. So yes, it's possible. Uh, Professor Raki says, thank, thank you for clarifying my questions. And uh, other professors are also thanking you, sir. We are out of um, time, and uh, I hope you will be able to answer further questions by email. Is that okay, sir? I absolutely. I'd be delighted to. Thank you very much, Mr. Schrader, and thank, thank you, you once sir. again for.